Oh, there, there. Thank you. Hi, I'm John Stauffer. Welcome to the second day of CS20. Uh, I'm the session chair for the morning, and the first speaker is Matt Browning, and here he is. <laughs> Thanks, John. Uh, thanks for the invitation to come speak. So um, the, the basic theme for today is how do you get something like that? How do you get, uh, we live next to a star that has some magnetism, and today's talks in one way or another will be trying to deal with, you know, you see that magnetism in a variety of ways, it has all this interesting behavior, uh, it shows up in lots of ways, and we'd like to understand, many of the speakers will be trying to understand where it comes from and what it does. Uh, and there are a, a few different techniques that people will talk about and use today uh, to do that. Um, but one of the ones that will run through a lot of the talks and posters uh, is this numerical simulations. This is just a, this picture down on the right is an image from a particular simulation that I'll talk about later. Um, and, and so the purpose of this talk is just to introduce um, some of the questions and themes that will go through uh, the rest of today and introduce you also to some of the tools that I think people will be using a lot. Uh, and introduce you to, to maybe the state of the art as of a couple of years ago. Um, so to be maybe a little bit more specific, one of the threads that I think runs through today and runs through this topic generally is just the diversity of stellar magnetism. So you see, you got to look for magnetism and you find uh, some stars are really, have really strong fields, some don't. Some have really clear magnetic cycles and some don't. So you know, why, 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 why? Um, and, and so lots of people will be trying to understand that in one way or another, why the sun has things like that and, and maybe a different star doesn't. What happens is you spin things up or spin things down or make a star less luminous or more luminous. Um, another class of talks will be kind of looking at, and posters also stretching into tomorrow, we'll be looking at, at um, why any of this matters. Why should anybody outside of this room care about stellar magnetism? What effect does it have on the structure or evolution of a star? Um, you know, and why should you care? So that's. Uh, and I'm, I'm, again, not going to answer any of these. I just get to introduce the questions and, and talk about them a little bit. Um, so I wanted to start, roughly speaking, I'll spend about half the time on, on the kind of observational landscape and about half the time, a little less than half, on the why. Um, so I want to start, though, with something just for, the, just for the students who are maybe here for their first cool stars uh, and just, a, a, just to tell you that you have a tremendous opportunity. So the, uh, the story in this subject is the same as in, in other parts of astronomy. So, you, well, you get are photons, um, generally speaking, and, and they come in and they hear your detector, pop, 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 pop. And, um, and you, know, you might measure them as a function of wavelength or as a function of time or maybe as a function of position on the sky. And uh, magnetism shows up in each of those signatures, right? So if you measure things, if you measure a spectrum, good enough precision, you might be able to detect the Zeeman broadening of a spectral line and get a field. That'll tell you something about the intensity of the magnetic field or its energy or its unsigned flux. People use those words. Um, if, you, if you can measure polarization, you might be able to infer something additionally about the orientation of the field relative to your line of sight. Um, if you measure things precisely enough as a function of time, you have good photometry, Kepler and Corot and Tess and all that, um, you might be able to see these great kind of light curves and infer something about the presence of spots or faculae or other phenomena on the surface of a star. Uh, and then later today, we'll hear even um, also about some cases where you have just, you know, you can image a, a star on the surface of the, on the, on the sky. So you have really, really precise positional information um, about where photons are coming from. And that, that of course, is a, is a revolution. Um, so the, the, the message I, wanna, I want you to, to know right away is that, you know, there, are, there have been real revolutions uh, along each of these dimensions. So the spectral resolution, spatial resolution, temporal resolution in the last decade or so. And those are continuing, and, and so you have real opportunities to learn a lot more. And that's coming at the same time as we have a kind of a revolution in computing power. Um, so you have a, a chance to understand maybe some of the data that comes out. So that's, um, that's enough evangelism. Here's the, what do you see? What do you see? Um, so you see a lot in the sun. Uh, this is just a, this thing on the left is a zoom in of a white light image and then a, a a uh, chromospheric emission line and then a magnetogram. So one color, one light will be sort of one polarity and dark will be another. Um, so the, the basic takeaway is that you see magnetism on every scale accessible to our observations. And um, while there's certainly a great deal of kind of small scale magnetic chaff down on the finest scales you can see, there's also this more ordered field that appears as active regions of spots and so forth. And those uh, have certain rules of propagation and evolution that are really interesting. So the most famous of those is this butterfly diagram at the top that's showing you essentially sunspot area as a function of time. 
So sunspots uh, or active regions appear typically first at mid-latitudes and then progressively nearer the equator over the course of roughly an 11-year cycle. Um, and, and the mystery here is that you know, the sun's an intensely turbulent place. So if you take the classic kind of fluid dynamics numbers of something relative to a diffusivity, Reynolds, Rayleigh, whatever, Taylor, uh, something relative to diffusivity, those are all ridiculously huge numbers. It's a turbulent place. And yet amidst that kind of uh, turbulence, there's still somehow order. You get these orderly patterns of, of propagation and evolution. And that's a real mystery. So um, we would like to understand how that happens. Um, you can also see in the sun specifically, you can see how magnetism is linked to all sorts of other phenomena. So one, one big one that is used then as a proxy in other stars um, is heating of the upper atmosphere. This is an image of a particular high energy emission line on the left from the Solar Dynamics Observatory. On the right is a magnetogram. You can see the magnetic field again kind of popping out through the surface. It's going up and then coming down. You these pairs of oppositely directed polarities. Um, and look, there, there's a lot of uncertainty about how exactly magnetism is linked to heating of an atmosphere, but um, they're just, you know, just, just by eye, there's a relationship there, okay? Um, and we'll hear lots more about that in, in various talks. So once you have that as a proxy, uh, you can go out and, and kind of look for the signs of surface magnetism in stars of other types. I mean, one of the annoying things about the sun is that you can't, um, you can't spin it up or spin it down. You can't make it more luminous or less luminous to try to figure out what's going on. So we can look at other stars to, to kind of try to get some of that same information. And the, the, the first takeaway message is that um, you tend to find surface magnetism where you find surface convection. So stars like the sun that have a convective envelope, um, stars that are fully convective, less massive, that convective envelope deepens. So by the time you get down to about a third of the solar mass, stars are convective everywhere. Um, those, those have lots of activity, and the stars that have uh, essentially a diminishing convective envelope and a convective core, you don't see so much magnetism up on that side of the HR diagram. And that, even if you didn't believe any of the theory I'm gonna talk about later, that's a pretty powerful observational clue that maybe convection has something to do with the generation of fields, either directly or indirectly. Um, so another big clue is that that activity is linked to rotation rate. So if you look at uh, a typical proxy of, of magnetic activity here, the uh, X-ray luminosity relative to the bull metric as a function of some measure of the rotation rate. So in this diagram, rotation increases to the left. Um, you see more and more activity as, as the rotation rate cranks up, up to some point where it sort of plateaus. And this is the, the famous rotation activity relation. Um, so this is, um, this, again, just a powerful clue. Independent of any particular theory, we know that rotation has something to do with the generation of magnetism, or at least the generation of surface activity. Um, you see that same kind of thing in, actually now, in spectral polarimetric data. I don't have time to talk about this, but Victor C is here. You can talk to him about it if you want. Um, and if you go look at these things for long enough, um, you find that some of them exhibit uh, cycles similar to the sun in these activity indices, and, and some don't. So um, this thing on the left is just an image, um, essentially, of, of chromospheric aging, calcium aging K emission, effectively, uh, as a function of time these clear modulations over, over sort of multi-year periods, um, there's been a long kind of quest to understand how things like the cycle period are related to um, parameters like rotation rate. Um, and that is a little bit of a complicated story right now, and, and Ricky Eglin, I think, is going to talk about it later today, so I'll skip it for now. Um, so all those things, uh, so far I've talked about ways that the magnetism responds to parameters like rotation rate, but it, it also feeds back on those things too. So one of the big ways it feeds back is that you know, stars are losing mass all the time. Uh, in the sun, it's not much. It's about 10 to the minus 14 solar masses a year, which turns out to be a little bit less than the mass it's losing just by radiation, the L over C squared. Um, but but you know, with that mass goes a little bit of angular momentum, too. And, and the, the, the magnetic field essentially sets the lever arm for that wind. It's part of what sets the lever arm. So this is, of course, just the schematic style spin down. That process leads to the slow, uh, inexorable kind of spin down of stars as they age. Um, on the right is some stuff from a, a series of calculations by Adam Finley and Sean Matt, um, looking at sort of um, simple models of, of simple simulations of winds with different magnetic field strengths and different geometries. The magnetic field strength increases to the right. The torque that's being exerted on the star effectively increases upwards. Um, and, and, okay, as you get stronger fields, obviously the spin down rate changes, but also as you change the geometry of the field, the spin down rate will change. So that's just one of the ways that magnetism can impact uh, the, the rotational evolution of a star. That is, um, you know, a little bit indirect. So you might ask, are there more direct um, 
tracers of the mechanism. They're more direct impact. And, and in the last um, X number of years, people have looked at, at maybe suggestions that magnetic, mag magnetism might be responsible for changing the overall structure of a star in certain cases. Um, this is really motivated by the, the observation that certain, with eclipsing binaries, that certain stars seem to be uh, inflated relative to model predictions and relative maybe to inactive cousins. Um, and, and, you know, people have, have suggested that either spots or maybe the global suppression of convection by some sort of magnetic inhibition might be responsible for this. Um, and there's a series of, of interesting papers talking about this in different ways. Um, we'll hear again more about this tomorrow, but just, just to understand in a, spend two minutes on why this is hard and why that's an interesting, if it's true, that's a really interesting observation to us, is that look, um, changing the radius of a star by five or 10% may not sound like much, but uh, it, it is hard, particularly for a, an object that's fully convective or close to it. So just to, and that is really because the radius of a star is linked uh, tightly to its internal entropy, a thermal property of the, of the uh, of the star. So this is just to give you a sampling of some, some pretty bog standard um, models of fully convective M dwarfs on the left. So this is the specific entropy as a function of radius or density. Uh, you get a pretty nearly isentropic interior uh, and then a fall off, an entropy jump near the surface. Now in the real star, that's set by all sorts of interesting physics, set by the interaction of radiation and convection and maybe magnetism and rotation and whatever else. Um, in mixing link theory, it's just set by alpha. Okay, that is what alpha does, is it sets the entropy jump and it sets the, the adiabat that the star sits on, the level of that interior entropy. And, you've, and um, you know, a kind of tenet of stellar structure is that that, um, that, that adiabat essentially then sets the radius of the, of the object. Okay, so just to demonstrate that on the right is, is some, the ratio of radii for models with different specific entropy. And you know, there's a very, very tight relationship. Um, once you know the entropy, you know the radius and vice versa, okay? Um, so the easiest way to change the radius, the most obvious way to change the radius is to, to have a thermally relevant field, okay? To have something that is big enough, um, if you're talking about a magnetic field, a big enough that, that would actually impact the, the pressure and temperature and entropy in the interior. And that's really tough because that, that would involve fields of maybe mega gauss or tens of mega gauss strength. Um, so I don't have time to talk about this in great detail, but I would say that those fields are, are, are probably much too strong. Um, we can talk about that more if you want, but effectively, independent of any um, real constraints from dynamo theory, um, you run into a couple of real problems. One is that the you know, fields of that strength tend to be buoyant. They act a little bit like a light fluid, and they tend to rise. And if they rise faster than they're regenerated by the convection uh, or by any other process, then that's a loss mechanism. Okay? So, you can, so you, know, you can get around that a little bit if, you, if the fields are predominantly on very small scales. Um, because then the turnover time is fast, they're regenerated quicker, they rise slower, um, but then you run into problems with the, the dissipative heating associated with those. In particular, the fact that um, you would end up dissipating more energy than the star has sitting around. So um, those two things kind of combine to put a limit on, on plausible field strengths. This sort of wedge on the, the, the left is uh, a, a combination of field sizes and field strengths uh, that might be allowed by these kinds of things. Um, so, so you have to turn to more reasonable field strengths, tens of kilogauss or something like that, and ask what those can do instead. Um, and and um, the answer is still that they might be able to do quite a bit, and that's essentially because the, the star um, is this, stars have this self-regulating thermostat property. So any, anything that affects even just the outer layers, um, it, that affects the rate at which energy is lost in the system, it changes the temperature structure out there, can affect the whole interior in a slightly indirect way. So Greg Fyden has done some really interesting work on this, um, trying to incorporate the effects of magnetism into a 1D stellar model. Um, the, this is really neat stuff, and it, and it seems to have, um, he seems to find that, that in some cases, the magnetic models um, match the data better than the non-magnetic ones. But you, know, yeah, you do have to, to, to um, keep in mind that this is based on a specific model of how magnetism is affecting the heat transport. So you'd like to understand whether that model is, is accurate. Okay, so we're now transitioning to the sort of why phase of the talk, um, and, and you know, we'd like to understand where all this comes from. Uh, and so some clues come from, again, from observational things. Um, helioseismology allows you to, to map out something about the interior angular velocity of the sun. Uh, in this map, this is angular velocity. Red stuff is fast, blue stuff is slow. Um, the surface differential rotation more or less imprints through the bulk of the convection zone. 
Um, but there's a sudden transition to nearly solid body rotation below the base of the correction zone. That region is called the tachocline, and it's been thought for, for a long time now to, in kind of classic models to play a significant role in the generation of fields. Um, one of the big surprises, I would say, of the last um, you know, X number of years in observationally has been, though, that, that fully convective stars, which don't have uh, exactly something akin to the tachocline, still seem to be similar in many respects, not in every respect, but in many respects, um, to the, to, to the magnetism that's being generated in, in more massive stars like the sun. So this is a really nice example from Nick Wright and company, just looking again at that rotation activity correlation uh, in fully convective stars. And they follow something that looks, you know, by eye, this is again, coronal emission as a function of rotation, um, that, you know, there is some relation. You could argue about slopes and things like this, but it's interesting. Um, you see the same thing also in chromospheric activity, some really nice stuff by Elizabeth Newton that we heard about at last, cool stars. So, so how do you get that? Um, well, okay. Dynamo theory in one sentence would be to say that, that building magnetic energy is not so difficult. A sufficiently complex flow in a sufficiently conducting fluid will probably work. But building an ordered field, building one that has order either in space or in time, um, is harder. And you need extra ingredients to do that. So the, the things that people talk about as playing particularly important roles are, are maybe the convection, uh, influenced by rotation, and, and the different rotation. So the alpha effect is one of these. Imagine you've got, okay, suppose we've got two kinds of fields. So we've got a, we've got a toroidal field, let's call it this way, and toroidal field, we'll call it this way. And, uh, and you imagine, okay, suppose I have a toroidal field and I take a convective eddy and it starts rising, but it twists because the Coriolis works. Well, you know, now it's a poloidal field. So you have this conversion process between toroidal and poloidal and back again. Uh, different rotation is basically, you know, I've got a toroidal field and I've got a flow that, that varies, whose speed varies in this direction. So, you know, the, this part is carried along a little bit faster than this part, differential rotation. Uh, and so I stretch it out and comb it into, um, into some toroidal field. Toroidal field. Now I can put my belt back on. Okay. So, um, so that's basically the cartoon. And, we, and there's lots of other effects, too, um, that I, I don't have time to talk about. But the idea, you know, we, we'd like to understand whether this kind of cartoon picture holds and how it varies in stars of different masses and radii and so forth. Okay, so one, lots of methods you could use to do that. I'm gonna talk in the last few minutes about uh, numerical simulations as a tool for understanding these kind of processes. Um, so, the, you know, in principle, this is easy. We just simulate the whole star uh, in full resolution. We solve the equations, all the answers are there. Um, the reality is that we can only resolve certain scales. We have to pick and choose our battles. Uh, and so sometimes we choose to resolve the largest scales, but have only kind of coarse representations of what's going on uh, at smaller ones. Sometimes we choose to, to focus in on a, a part of a star uh, at very high resolution, but then we lose some of the global dynamics. And then there's also you know, 1D models that parameterize things in certain ways, but you can evolve for a tremendously longer period of time. Um, just one kind of aside, uh, some of the tools that we use to do this that I'll show in a second um, you know, have been developed by people over a number of years, uh, sometimes, uh, and sometimes made very generously available. So if you wanted to do this yourself, if you come away from this talk and you're excited by convection, you can go and download many of these things uh, yourself. Rayleigh and Magic are kind of global scale convection codes for the full spherical stuff. Daedalus can do that too, but it also does a lot of uh, useful for a wide class of PDEs. Okay, so just to give you a sense of what these kinds of things look like, um, this is from a particular simulation on a particular radial surface of a particular type of star. The simulation is 3D, but this map is just one radial surface kind of unwrapped. Um, the upflows are red, the downflows are blue, and you see a lot of different stuff going on. So the, the upflows are hot and, and they expand, uh, and the downflows are cool and contract, so you have this asymmetry between upflows and downflows um, that is, is one of the first things you notice. Um, if you look a little bit more carefully, you might see that at high and low latitudes, the pattern of convection is fairly isotropic. Um, at mid latitudes, it's shaped a little bit by rotation. It's aligned with the rotation axis in a particular way. Uh, that's one of the signatures, uh, kind of common signatures of rotationally influenced convection. Um, and that is really one of the threads that runs through a lot of this stuff. So the, just the, the overarching influence of rotation. So this is an example, again, radial velocity on a few spherical surfaces from some calculations that Nick Featherstone did. Um, and you know, the, the one on the top left isn't rotating at all. The one on the bottom right is rotating a lot. And you know, as when, con when rotation is absent, convection does what it wants to do. It gets the heat up. Okay? And the convective patterns kind of meander all over the sphere. There's no obvious preferred direction apart from the, the density stratification one. Um, but as, as Coriolis forces come into the picture, the convection becomes kind of slaved to that Coriolis force. 
Uh, and the, the, the magnitude of the Coriolis force relative to the kind of vigor of the convection it turns out to be what matters in this uh, context. And if you, if you take this to an extreme case, I mean, the, the, the rotation actually starts stabilizing the system against the convection. That's a real effect, by the way. It's not a, just a wacky simulation thing. If you, if you go, people build these crazy experiments where you, you fill a giant tank with fluid and you heat it and you spin the heck out of it. And, and if you have one of these experiments at fixed driving, so that would be a horizontal line in this particular diagram, and you crank up the rotation that's moving to the right in this diagram, so it's convecting, it's convecting, it's convecting, you spin it up, and eventually it'll stop convecting. That is a real thing. Um, so, you know, the, the influence, so rotation um, matters for the heat transport. Um, rotation matters for the heat transport. This is just, um, it's maybe not surprising that if it changes the flows, it'll change the way those flows transport heat. Um, so this is just looking at the temperature gradient at the middle of a series of calculations of rotating convection, some work by Adrian Barker, as a function of rotation rate. And the basic punchline is that as you go to more rapid rotation, and rotation is starting to stabilize the convection. You need steeper and steeper temperature gradients. The convection is, in some sense, less efficient as you go to more rapid rotation. And you know, maybe the, the slope we can argue a little bit about. But this is actually a really nice example of something where um, the simulations and kind of mixing link style arguments, this paper by Dave Stevenson in the 70s, uh, and, and also really proper asymptotic uh, theory, Keith Julian's work, uh, 2012, those all give actually the same scaling for how the temperature gradient uh, should vary with rotation rate. So that's something um, that, that you can go and take away and plug into models. Uh, we've, done, we've done that, but I don't have time to talk about it. Okay, so the rotation, the convection transports heat, but also transports angular momentum. So you start one of these things in solid body rotation, and generically it will not end up in solid body rotation. It will end up with something else. Uh, this is maps of the angular velocity in a series of calculations uh, at different rotation rates. Uh, red stuff is fast, blue stuff is slow. And as you crank up the rotation, you know, at, at rapid enough rotation, you tend to see something that looks vaguely like the sun, in the sense they have a fast equator and a slow pole. Um, as you move to slower rotation, you uh, eventually get to the point where that flips, so we would expect a slow equator and a fast pole. Again, just generically, that's what the, I'm not saying that's what stars do, I'm saying that's what the simulations do, okay? Um, you can catalog sort of what the shear rate is as a function of rotation rate. It's a little inset from a paper by Sasha Brun. Um, if you want to really rapid rotation rates, there's another regime where you get kind of banded zonal flows, and that's, we think, the regime that, that Jupiter and other giant planets are in. Um, so it matters for the, the mean field to drive. It also matters, of course, for the field generation, and that's the, the part to close the circle. Um, this is just a plot of the dipole, the fraction of the magnetic field that's in the dipole component as a function of something like rotation rate. Rotation's increasing to the left, uh, and you, you see that you know, rotation, again, favors the generation of of more large-scale ordered fields. So you get more and more field in the dipole component. Now, there's, this, is, this is actually for planetary dynamo calculations, I have to say. So there's not stratification and things like that. But, um, but it's that, that basic behavior seems to be pretty robust. You get lots of different behavior. Uh, but I would say one of the surprises, um, again, has been that, that you can seemingly generate fields that are ordered both in space and in time without the aid, necessarily, of a tachyc line of shear. Um, so some examples by a nice paper by Rakesh Shidav looking at M-dwarf magnetism, so generating a, a global dipole in, a, in the midst of a full, uh, deep shell of convection. Um, some other really nice examples of propagating fields, Petri Capilla. This one on the left was a, from a movie by Lucia Duarte. And again, you see a systematic generation of fields um, and, and propagation of those over time. We're now finally starting to get to the point where uh, there are enough of these things that show magnetic cycles you can actually ask, okay, how does the cycle period depend on rotation rate and things like that? Um, we'll hear a lot more about this in talks later today and I think in some of the splinters, so I won't say too much. Um, maybe one counterintuitive thing is that some of these calculations, this is from a paper by Antoine Stugarek, uh, the one on the bottom is from Jorn Wernicke. Um, the, the sense in the simulations is that more rapid rotation actually yields longer uh, cycles, and that has to do with the rate, the way that differential rotation is changing as a function of rotation rate. Um, again, we'll hear more about this later. Um, we'd like, ideally, to use these calculations to, to say something about the way that, again, the impact of the magnetism. What does magnetism do to heat transport and ultimately to structure? Um, and we're not really there yet. We don't have a complete theory. But I will say that that interaction can be a little bit complex. Let me give you kind of one example. Um, shear differential rotation typically reduces the convective efficiency. Okay? So you imagine, this is easy to understand, imagine a convective plume trying to carry heat out and it gets just walloped by some shear flow. It's like Frogger, if you've played that game when you were a kid. 
um, the truck comes along and wallops the convection. Um, so the, the convective efficiency goes down, but you know, we also know that magnetism generally reduces shear. Okay? So if, a, if I take a calculation and I put magnetism into it, the difference rotation inevitably goes down. Um, so in that particular sense, you can, you can easily find examples where the, the heat flux actually goes up in the presence of magnetism. Um, because it reduces the shear more than it does other things that maybe hurt the, the convection. Um, and there, there's some examples of this, particularly in another paper by Rakesh uh, in 2016. Okay, so what do I want you to take away from all this? I've shown you various things that the simulations do, and various other people are going to show you lots of things that the simulations do, and, and how, what, what should you, you, you think about it? Um, so I think about it a little bit like I'm wanna, I want to go on vacation or holiday. Um, and where I'd like to go is this private island. Um, you can rent it for $42,000 a night. And it's, um, it's, you know, the, the beach would be lovely and the water would be warm and the food and the wine would be spectacular and you know, the whole thing would be great. But I am a professor in England. I do not, uh, I won't be going to a private island anytime soon. So the, um, so, you know, but, but Exeter is, is about 11 miles from the southwest coast of England. Uh, and so there's, I can go to the beach anytime I want. Um, it's a little different. Um, but, you know, there, there's, but, but, you know, if you care about certain things, it's okay, right? So if, if what you care about is the smell of salt water or the way that seagulls sound as they try to steal your food, you know, you can get that just fine in Exmouth. Um, and if you cared more about the feel of the sand or the, you know, hot weather or something, you could go somewhere else um, that you could afford to go, right? Now, you can't get all of it at the same time. You can't get the private island. And this is the same story with the simulations. We're, We'd love to be able to simulate every aspect of the sun or other stars for, for a Hubble time. We can't do that. But maybe by visiting all these different beaches and trying to learn something in each of them, we can, we can figure out the bits that we care about uh, about the private island. Okay, so I hope I've, I've kind of left you with the message that, look, um, magnetism is really pervasive in stars. Um, it's shaped by convection. And maybe we can learn some, some things about that um, by numerical simulation. So I'll, I'll stop there, and thanks for your time. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Questions? Um, thank you. Pierre Max Dead, Keele University. Uh, can you give us a feel from the observer's point of view for these different regimes that you were talking about, uh, from no rotation to banded zonal rotation? Uh, in terms of the main sequence stars you showed in the eclipsing binaries at the start, uh, what that corresponds to in terms of just rotation period? I mean, in the splinter session yesterday, we were looking at rotation periods of stars, M dwarfs, from mm. a few hours up to a few days up to a few weeks. Um, are those different regimes? Yeah, so, okay, um, first of all, the, the paper by Sasha and collaborators um, kind of tries to tie those regimes to specific masses and rotation rates, so Brun et al. 2017, I think. So uh, I'd refer to that. Uh, qualitatively, I would say, for the M dwarfs, no, um, they're all probably in the kind of rapidly rotating regime, and the, the reason for that really um, is something to do with this. So, I mean, if I look at, at, when I say that the rotation has to be rapid, what I really mean is that it has to be rapid relative to convection. Um, and so this is the kind of Rossby number thing. Uh, and in an M dwarf, um, let's say, you know, that, that, that velocity is set more or less by the flux you have to carry and by the density. So it goes like F over rho to the one third in a, in a mixing length style um, picture. And, and, you know, the flux in an M dwarf is not so big and the density is really high. So the velocities are low. In the deep interior of an M dwarf, it might be, you know, a, a meter a second or something like that, a couple meters a second. So you could outrun it. Um, and, and so the, you know, the, the Coriolis forces have a really long time, the rotation period, even if it's, even if it's days, right, they have a long time to influence those flows that are trudging along in a meter a second. Um, so the, the M dwarfs are probably all in the rapidly rotating kind of regime. Uh, great talk, Matt, and I have about 20 questions, but, um, let me ask one. Um, so, especially in the sun, there's, there's discussions about two dynamos, a surface or turbulent dynamo and, a, and a, the kind of deep dynamo that gives rise to large scale fields. And so could you comment or what your thoughts are on, on the existence of multiple dynamos in, in, in the sun and stars? 
Yeah, sure. Um, well, so it's a, it's a complicated issue, but I would say the general idea that you probably do have, my, I should say at the beginning here, I should have said in the talk that there's, there's almost no controversy, I would say, about what the simulations find. There is, um, you know, we all find the same things if you run the same parameters with different tools and things like that. There is a little bit of controversy that the art of it and the, the debate about it is what, how you then take that and apply it to a star. And, um, what aspects of it carry over to a star. Um, so in that particular question, we have the, I, I, what I think, my interpretation of the data, is that um, there probably is a, a pervasive sort of small scale dynamo that, it, I mean, at the, near the surface of the star, the, of the sun, the convection doesn't give a width about rotation. It really doesn't. I mean, it's just, it's whipping around much too fast. Um, so that is a different kind of, of generation process than deeper down where you probably have very low amplitude flows um, that are very strongly influenced by rotation or, or at least more strongly influenced by rotation. So it, conceptually at least, there is this kind of two dynamo separation. Now, in practice, those two things talk to each other. The field that's generated by a global deep-seated thing can be shredded by the convection, uh, it can, and, and that shows up in all sorts of ways, this babcock Leighton effect and, and other things. But conceptually, I think that is a useful distinction to make, this two dynamo stuff. Younger people uh, in math. Um, Ofer Kern, University of Massachusetts Law. Very nice talk. Um, it's, it's pretty much a follow-up question of what you just said. Um, the solar cycle is a very stable signal. Okay, we, sometimes it's a little bit early, sometimes it's late, the magnitude changes, but it's a very stable cycle, so you would, you would think that even with a simple, relatively simple stability analysis, you would get that time scale. Uh, and these models can pretty much try to do the same thing. Um, is there something fundamental we're missing? And I particularly would like to hint at the small scale that we cannot really resolve in these simulations. And another thing that uh, if you can comment, and you just uh, say my did, is that uh, we did have discussions in these Dynamo uh, uh, sessions that maybe what we see on the surface is a manifestation that doesn't really represent what's below it. Yeah, okay, so uh, a couple things. So, um, first of all, I think you know, it's true that, that getting cycle periods bang on is, is hard, and it's, you might think that it's this... Um, it's, a, it's an easy feature of the magnetism to recover, but it, when you think about it, it's actually a, a fairly stringent test of, of any given model, right? Because it, it, to get it right, you've got to get the differential rotation right, you've got to get the magnetism, the strength of the magnetism right, and you've got to get uh, the interaction between those things right, and you've got to get you know, the vigor of the convection right? Because in a, in a standard uh, alpha-omega dynamo model, let's say, um, the, the cycle period is set both by the shear and, and by the helicity of the convection, right? Um, and I would argue that you know, we're getting close in all of those things, but none of them are quite right, okay? So the, the vigor of the convection is probably a bit off, the difference between is probably a bit off, the magnitude is probably a bit off. So it's surprising to me, actually, that you can get anything, I mean, this stuff, uh, this paper by Antoine and the other one by Jorn, I mean, there's, there's some wiggle room maybe in that slope, but it is striking to me that, that you get anything, A, that you get cycles at all, and B, that they're in vaguely the right ballpark uh, for the sun. I, I absolutely agree with you, though, that, that um, there's lots of small-scale physics that may play an important role that we're still missing in these models. And as we push to, to higher and higher resolutions and lower and lower diffusivities, you see some of that dynamics happening. Um, there are some examples for, uh, there's a nice paper by Hideyuka Hata uh, in Science uh, a year or two ago, looking at basically how order kind of shows up in the low resolution models, disappears for a while, and then re-emerges actually at, at high, high enough resolutions. Um, I'm a little bit more skeptical of the idea that, that, there is, um, that the surface stuff is uncoupled to the deep interior. It could be, but you know, again, my interpretation is that you know, I, I, magnetism's tough to keep down, man. You gotta, it's, it, uh, it, it, is, it is likely, I think, that whatever is going on below the outer uh, percent or so of the star um, has some signal at the surface, whether we understand it or not. Um, Keep us on schedule. I think uh, we'll stop here and uh, thank Matthew again.